welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Harder. I'm the uh, Interim Executive Director at the Amistad Research Center. And on behalf of Amistad and our partners at the Rivers Institute, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's conversation. Uh, this conversation is the culmination of artist Troy Montez Michi's time with us in New Orleans, uh, time at Amistad exploring our collections, which is gonna be the topic of tonight's talk. Um, this is um, part of a uh, artist in residency program that is sponsored by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We'd like to thank the Mellon Foundation for their support. We'd like to thank our partners at Rivers Institute, the Jazz Museum for hosting us tonight, Troy and Ashley for joining us in what's going to be a wonderful conversation. And we'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us this evening. And I'd like to turn it over to Jordan from the Rivers Institute to give uh, some introductions tonight. Hi, I hate speaking in front of a, in a microphone, so I'm gonna make this very quick. Um, my name is Jordan Amarcani. I am a curator with the Rivers Institute here in New Orleans. Um, I am delighted to have Troy and Ashley with us this evening. And um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a back uh, some context for what Rivers is about and what we are doing here and then give some introductions to our artists and we'll be good to go. So Rivers was founded in 2020 it's a, and Rivers is a nonprofit institute committed to the art of the diaspora. Based in New Orleans, a community whose history and futures are predicated upon and consigned to migration, Rivers invests in long form projects with artists who draw from and give form to diasporic conditions. Rivers' partnership with Amistad Research Center affirms our commitments to advance contemporary art that makes a study of history through the wealth of the archive. Together, we welcome artists from around the world to New Orleans for extended research and study as they develop new work or immerse themselves in new areas of interest. So without further ado, I will move on to introductions. Troy Montes Michi, through assemblage and juxtaposition, Troy Montes Michi engages black consciousness, Latinx experience, immigration, and queerness, and, inve and investigates the ways in which bodies of marginalized communities are frequently erased and fetishized. Montez Michi holds a BFA from the University of Texas at El Paso and an MFA from Yale School of Art. His works have been recently included in exhibitions at the Institute for Contemporary Art at VCU Richmond, the MAC in Belfast, the Shed in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and, and the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, where his work is currently on display. He is currently a lecturer of visual art in, in the visual arts program at Princeton University. Ashley Teamer. Ashley Teamer's collages explores the relationships between the body, nature, space, and time. She uses painting, sculpture, photography, and sound to creatively intervene with indoor and outdoor architecture, revealing the malleability of our built environment. She has been an artist in residence at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and the Joan Mitchell Center here in New Orleans. Tima received a BFA from Boston University in 2013 and an MFA from Yale University in 2022. Her work has been most recently exhibited as a series of billboards called Lady Blue Devils in New Orleans. And our moderator tonight is Andrea Anderson, who serves as founding director and chief curator of Rivers Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought. She is co-curator of Troy Montes Michi Rock of Eye, now on view at Cam Houston, and Ito Barada Ways to Baffle the Wind, now on view at Mass Mocha. Previous curatorial projects include Sanford Bigger's Code Switch, Adam Pendleton Becoming Imperceptible, Cecilia Vicuña About to Happen, Jakob Nordstrom Why is Everything a Rag, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick Labor Studies, and Hinge Picture, Eight Women Occupy the Third Dimension, among others. She has taught at Barnard College and New York University, and she is an alumna of Stanford University, where she received her BA, and Columbia University, where she received her MA, MPhil, and PhD. So without further ado, I'll let you guys take it over. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to everyone who joins us here tonight. Um, to, we are so happy to finally welcome Troy uh, into conversation in New Orleans with artist Ashley Teamer. 
Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Ashley pretty much since I moved back to New Orleans in 2015, um, and to know her practice prior to um, her recent adventures in MFA land. Mm -hmm. um, and I have had the great fortune to work with Troy over the last few years um, on the publication for Rock of I, the subsequent exhibition which opened at the California African American Museum in LA and is now on view at Ken Houston, and now together as an Amistad Rivers research resident. I was trying to do the math last night, and I think it was about five years ago, which seems insane, but I think so. When I first reached out to Troy, um, in another life, another incarnation, I think for both of us, um, with interest in developing an exhibition together. And I, I mentioned this sort of historical moment mostly um, to acknowledge sort of the beautiful out of orderedness um, of everything that we have done together. Um, Troy was to have been, as context, um, our first Amistad Rivers research resident. Um, and then a thing called the pandemic came and intervened. And so we began um, at the other end. And uh, we actually began with the book for Rock of I, which then led to the exhibition of Rock of I, um, and then now into new research um, in Amistad's archive. And because of this sort of transposition of time, um, instead of mining an archive of other people's um, uh, historical archive, you know, uh, um, materials, um, you began by mining your own archive um, and revisiting kind of earlier work as fugitive fragments and, and reimagining them. Um, Ashley, you've also worked with archival material, uh, both the material remnants of another's practice um, and public material, um, as well as personal material. And so you know, in thinking about archival practice and it's necessarily out of orderedness, I want to begin by asking kind of what's the difference between using an archive um, of others, an archive that's housed in a place like Amistad, and, and returning to your own work um, as archival material and that kind of self-reflection and treatment? Well, Who I'm wants to go first? <laughs> 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 Using an archive of <laughs> others. Um, I don't in, in many ways, I think the archive of others feels very similar to my own explorations. Like as a kid, I was really into um, looking at photographs with my grandmother and hearing about stories and just kind of being baffled how people looked different <laughs> <laughs> beyond my existence. Um, and even in the archive, going into the space, there's something for me just very important about kind of sh kind of sifting through the remnants of existence. Um, so like reading a letter, I don't know, there's something very personal about it. And I, I, I gravitate to that kind of energy, but also, I don't know, there's just something for me that's very powerful to see the trace of a letter that somebody wrote who is no longer alive or a photograph that was taken and not knowing any idea of like the circulation that that photograph would end up being in an archive and I'd be looking at it now in 2022. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think mining the archives helped me, um, I guess, broaden my own story to kind of take myself out of um, this more kind of personal familial space. Mm -hmm. You had talked, we were talking just the other day about, you know, kind of some of the earliest work I saw of yours was work that included, say, WNBA mm -hmm. cards. Um, it, it took you someplace different than maybe some more recent work that really draws from your own personal experience. Yeah, I think I kind of, I liked what you were saying about the seeing yourself in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what led me to um, basketball cards and sports cards in general, because I was at before that I was making abstract paintings that felt like very much in like internal but also open I don't know there was a very internalness to it that I was really enjoying exploring at that time but I gravitated towards the decisiveness of these images because of what they kind of reflected back at me that I really needed in that moment which was like a type of like strength and perseverance that mm -hmm. I just needed that's what I needed and so mm -hmm. I was like I need to go find that Mm -hmm. um, and I think in an interesting way, it like took me back to my own history, which is that my grandmother was a basketball coach. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of, it's, it's a interesting 
thing to look for something outside of yourself that like ultimately does leads like you lead you back into mm-hmm. a back door and you're like oh my gosh <laughs> like, <laughs> that's mine i would have never gotten here <laughs> if i hadn't like gone on this more longer journey yeah. searching and there's like a searching to it mm-hmm. yeah I, I i think that's a it's very interesting to see uh as we inv- have invited artists into amistad's archive to see where where they begin and where they end, but also where they find themselves. I think that there's a huge part of archival work that is about locating oneself in that archive mm-hmm. as well. Um, Troy, you and I began thinking about a show that is completely different than the show that we realized, <laughs> which is super fun. Um, but that show had, what in our earliest conversations, it was about um, putting in the foreground uh, the female figure. Uh, much of your practice has really uh, looked at histories of the male figure. And in order to do that, uh, it felt important to trace your own matriarchal history. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that became a little bit too personal. And you found... So I'm I'm curious about that... um, that place where it become where it gets too much mm-hmm. oneself, um, but also that avenue that you found that maybe uh, that brought you back to that same body of material, but through a public framework. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there, there's going to be so much to be said after these years that we've all been living yeah. in the pandemic. And one thing. I had just gotten a hot, a hotter fellowship, so I felt really lucky because I didn't have to teach during that crazy <laughs> time. Mm-hmm. I kind of bypassed it, but I just really wanted to do something as a thank you to the women in my family, um, like these amazing matriarchs who raised me. And I don't know, I always kind of, I had a very close relationship with my grandmother and I wanted to just do something um, as like a thank you. Mm-hmm. Even though, I mean, she already knows how much I, I did appreciate her. But as I was, like, racking my brain, I think for almost years, yeah. years and years, and I I went home, I got all my family photographs, I scanned them all, I was do, I was trying to make collages with them. But the, the, the tricky thing was I realized with the current, or the, the work that I was doing with the erotic magazines, I, I couldn't approach the material in the same way because it, it was in a very different sentiment. And the other work was more about confusing this kind of fetishistic gaze mm-hmm. um, for the viewer. And this one was more of like a sentimental one and mm-hmm. a personal one. Um, but I don't know, like sometimes when I'm making, I feel like I forget my own <laughs> practice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait, you always start off super literal. And like, what's, what's the next phase? And for me, it was abstraction. Yeah. Um, which then me led to me reading the book, The Woman in the Zoot Suit, mm-hmm. and really kind of seeing what they termed as like an aberrant like feminism kind of to the women in my family because they ran the show. Like they did whatever they wanted, that's and right. I loved it. Um, yeah. uh, I Troy recently, w- in coordination with their exhibition, Rock of I, had the opportunity to be in conversation with Catherine Esteramirez, um, the author of, of Woman in the Zoot Suit. Um, and it, it for you know we'll be showing some pictures in a moment, and a lot of your practice has has really taken the shape and history of the zoot suit to unpack all mm-hmm. sorts of of um, histories of subjectivity. But to see that it was a really c- sort of late stage in our project, which actually brought us back to the beginning, which mm-hmm. you know where we thought we were going to be foregrounding the female figure, um, and then we were, uh, but at the very <laughs> end uh, through through women's uh, female zoot suitors. Um, I think, you know, this question of visibility, and that's and that part of that, what, what we're talking about is who gets shown and who is seen. And But the question of visibility and what's private and what's public, I think in the context of an archive, um, is also about wh- what is the history that gets told, right? Um, it's something that we've spoken about a lot at Amistad, um, together with Jade Flint, who is in the room. Um, who uh, works together with Amistad and Rivers, and who has been part and and of this project since its since its origin, um, helping to cull materials, but also interested in what materials historically have you know what's been kept and what's mm-hmm. been circulated. Um, both of your practices uh, lean into questions of visibility in really significant ways, um, and I want to. 
pull out a little bit um, further here. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, I think in your practice, this question about intentional obscurity, um, what is censored uh, is really foregrounded. And um, there are multiple toys, m multiple ways, Troy, that you toy with the questions of visibility. And I think, you know, I wonder if you could share a little bit about the way that you have um, made use of um, archival erotic magazines, but also their censorship, their circulation in the history of your practice. I think the, um, the first time I started using them, it came out of a place where, I mean, I went to school for painting and I w realized like right. halfway through. You do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Neither of them paint today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. a little bit, a little bit. But then I realized, like, I was like, wait, I don't have to paint everything. <laughs> and I discovered collage. And so I would glue in physique pictorial magazines. Um, but I would draw over the figures mm -hmm. to make them brown. <laughs> 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 and um, that was kind of the first time I ever used them. But the more I started to look at that history, I don't know. I mean, I, I had just come out of the closet. I was feeling just very kind of, I didn't see any representation of queerness um, for like POC identity in El Paso because it's such a Catholic community. Mm -hmm. So everything I saw was representations of white men who had certain body types. And the more I started to research that, the more I started to find out about these magazines that were kind of catered towards that specific gaze, um, consuming um, black bodies or brown bodies kind of as objects. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to just confuse that gaze to try to bring about some type of autonomy. Like even if it wasn't a total transformation, for me, like the, the slightest shift could be kind of a step towards confusing kind of their like static placement throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. I, um, when I went to your show in Houston, I was like, my friend and I were both looking at, at so much motion so there's also a sense of like mm -hmm. because it's being obscured it kind of puts the figure into a motion or something so they're kind of like going away from you or going towards you like getting really really close or going far away which i think also kind of gives them agency too because they're they're like moving around in a way there's also the sense of expectation about them i mean uh that they will be very revealing mm -hmm. um and I, I, I share this story because I'm, I share it with everyone everywhere now because I hate it so much. But recently, um, I was drop locked out of my Dropbox account <laughs> because of Troy. Uh, <laughs> um, but what I thought, you know, we've talked a lot about this as, a, as an organization. First, is there any other option? Um, what other instrument can we use? But it was because I had violated the terms of use of Dropbox um, because of Troy. Um, be, and, and what is so fascinating about it is that there's actually nothing explicit in any of the collages. Oh, because of the images. It's because of the images. Oh, wow. I had, I had um, well, <laughs> they said I had child pornography on my, on my Dropbox, um, which I don't. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it was, I think it was this really interesting, um, and, and if I do, so do many other people in this room. Um, but it was an interesting um, moment of, of recognizing that sort of, uh, expectation for a kind of work, right? That there's a that there's a, a historical, even like gaze that you rec recognize. Mm -hmm. I already know what this material is, without any kind of looking. Um, and um, but this brings, you know, I think the conversation back, and we were having lots of conversation about it because, of course, we had written a great deal about censorship in the context of your work, um, and the changing nudity laws around print publication. And I'm curious how that history um, informs your work with the material. I think I was kind of into the fact that it was presented as a men's workout magazine, mm -hmm. and it was pocket sized to reach kind of like s not large urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, so inherently the magazine was a facade in that it was showing kind of these like youthful, muscular men as a way of being like, they did these workouts, but there was no workouts in the <laughs> magazine. So it was just kind of showing off the physique. Um, so for me, it kind of always, I don't know, it, it kind of was, a, was proof that there was always an alternative lifestyle like just below 
I don't know, like underneath the type of veil where like I saw those type of magazines in the 90s when I'd go to Walgreens and my grandma would pick up her prescriptions. <laughs> um, and I'd be like, I don't know about this workout magazine because it, it's <laughs> a little different than what I'm used to looking at. Um, but I kind of feel like that was a marker where I first realized that maybe there was something <laughs> a little bit um, different with my own sexuality. Um, yeah, but it's, I don't know, there's, they were very fascinating just thinking about this coded language in terms of like symbols um, that would help the viewer to see like the personality of the model. Mm -hmm. But then again, it only kind of amplified white queerness. And then if it was a person of color, um, then they were a stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, there's another way that you have treated uh, visibility or, or explored visibility in your practice. And that has to do with the history of camouflage. Mm -hmm. um, you grew up in El Paso, uh, one of the largest military bases in the country is there. Um, can you talk a little bit about your use of camouflage in, uh, in your collages? Camouflage mm -hmm. came about, I don't know, I always feel like I say too much. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's like every artist knows that, that dreaded moment where you're, when you're applying to applications and you're like, what is my work about? And you're just like staring at the work, hoping it's going to speak to you. And um, of course, I kno know what it's about, but it's like, how can I filter it in this official language that's going to get me this grant? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I don't know what you're talking oh about. Oh, my God. And this word camouflage just kept coming up. And a lot of times in my practice, it's, it's not only images that I collect, but phrases from things that I read. But I also research a lot with word lists. And I started to research camouflage, and I was just really struck by its whole history, not only growing up in El Paso and seeing desert camo my whole life, but also that artists had a huge hand in developing camouflage theory at the exact same time as the zoot suit, like the zoot mm -hmm. suit heyday. So early or late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, and I was fascinated by this one term called disruptive patterning, which is not an about invisibility but it's more about a confusion of the eye. Mm -hmm. And that for me, that's how I saw, I, I was trying to kind of think about the gaze of, of how people in that time were looking at the Zoot Suitor as an oddity, as something confusing that they couldn't understand. So that's kind of how I gravitated towards mm -hmm. um, disruptive coloration or pattern. Mm -hmm. Actually, in our conversations, um, you used the word, and we talked. We laughed about it. The word tessellation came up um, more than more than once. Um, and I and I, the way that you use ornamentation. I mean, the way that you use patterning is is not strictly ornamentation. There's a there is a kind of a con s disruption of visibility. And I wonder if you can speak to how you understand that in your collages. Yeah, th try to like. I try to also disrupt and confuse, but in a way that merges different moments all into mm -hmm. one. So like in this piece right here, which actually has my brother in it, mm -hmm. um, I kind of like have this, these, all these moments that I'm seeing with, through the camera that I s remember are related. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of use them to create a new environment. So like there's the, I don't know if y'all know, the like pond in the botanical garden that has black water, like mm -hmm. the water is black and they have these really bright green lily pads. And so whenever I was looking at it, I was like, oh, this is like night, like day for night, where like if I put a moon here, it would look like this was at nighttime. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited by creating those relationships across different moments. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like saw that too in your show, Troy, because I was just enjoying like the, the how the stitching together, like it blurs it, but then at the same time, like you are forced to focus on different moments that are like more textured I guess but from the place so it's like both specific it's both very specific but then also like breaks it open for more interpretation by using through using reality which like which is like the fun thing that I love about collage is it allows you to reach abstraction and representation simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have this image up also just because I okay. you know the kind of um, I, I my sense is that whenever I see pattern in your work 
you are troubling it. Mm. Um, <laughs> you are causing trouble. Um, but this work is also that space of like, it's, there's a kind of confusion, I think, to the, the, sur the function of reflection mm -hmm. um, and visibility in terms of mirroring. And I wonder if you can share a little bit more. Yeah, with this piece, I, um, so the part that's a little bit cropped, there's uh, the word Mississippi and then mm -hmm. rivers in the front of the chair. And so what I did was I, I kind of, I created this font that's like kind of gothic, but I spread the word out. So like the first line is like M a bunch of times and then ISS and then you can see like the is. So I wanted people to look at it and then try to start to hear it in their minds, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that kind of abstraction and stretching like slows down your read of, of the object or the image, um, which kind of, you know, you're trying to like get Im ideas in people's minds. <laughs> like, you know, you have to like slow it down so that it's more embodied than just like, oh, I looked at it, I got it, I. <laughs> in terms of um, invisibility, I think another way that, another tool both of you use to get ideas in people's minds, um, and this goes back to my Dropbox a little bit, um, is, uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep coming back, um, is by not showing. It's that, it's that moment where you take away. Mm -hmm. um, and Ashley, you have been, I'm gonna bring up a little bit of work here. Um, that's just a beautiful work, so oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put that right there. Um, you've been doing a lot of work lately um, that doesn't, about something that you don't show. Yeah. Um, and that's about something that here in New Orleans we often can't see. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at? <laughs> yeah, this is. We're not looking at. This is um, a London Avenue, one of the sections of the London Avenue Canal wa levee walls. Um, and for the past, I think, year, I've been doing working on a public art project that um, has to do with the transformation of um, uh, Gentilly into a place that where water can actually flow through freely. Um, so I just became super hyper focused on all of the walls that kind of surround us and all of the water that is traveling below our feet um, that controls where we can physically move and also controls where water can move. And then, of course, there's always a rupture. Um, and so I think, and that also kind of like mirrors with life and, you know, our bodies are ruptured and surfaces can be ruptured. Um, but yeah, all of the water is hidden. So I think I've been going around, this is the, um, Bonacary spillway and just kind of ob like looking at and observing these places that I've seen my whole life and that we've seen our whole lives that we just kind of let pass by, um, and really thinking about, um, just like native communities and other people that have developed ways of living with water that are not through concrete, but through more porous surfaces. Did or you say porous? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's like, there's always something that's, it's always gonna get through. And I think that's growing up here, we were talking about this, like you're not, you don't grow up with the knowledge that something, now you do, but like before mm -hmm. Katrina, it wasn't a knowledge that it's always, the water is gonna come through. video but it doesn't appear to be videoing. Doesn't want to video? Mm -hmm. Doesn't want to video anymore. Maybe press race bar? We'll do what you say. Oh. This is why we <laughs> invite the artist. <laughs> <laughs> um oh I guess oh, should I pause or just listen for just a second. Can you hear? So can you tell us a little bit about that installation? Oh, yes. Um, I have been experimenting with using sound emanating from a sculpture as kind of like, I guess, the way that water might travel through, like the Mississippi River travels through, you know, water travels through any space. It like forms to that space. And so I've been tr experimenting with creating these sculptures that emit sound and that sound will then change the character of the space. So with that piece, I originally came up with it during like deep COVID when at my school they got rid of all the furniture so no one could sit together. Um, <laughs> and there was no furniture like one week before I put that piece <laughs> up there, but I put it there because there was a fountain that I was passing by and I just wanted to like 
changed the character of that location, which was so, again, like concrete, solid, like non-porous and very austere. Um, and so this is another piece that I made. And this one kind of like emitted a very like pulsing beat throughout the space, which actually I ended up feeling like was actually a little bit too appropriate. Mm -hmm. for the space like it was mm -hmm. very much like went along with white gallery walls mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm kind of experimenting with doing using samples and beats that are more disruptive or just like to completely change the, the vibe mm -hmm. of wherever it's located mm -hmm. um, now it works oh. <laughs> um, but this you know coming back to the you know the pictures of the levee walls borderlands levees um, passport checks, um, all the ways that we control movement and bodies. Um, you know, this has been, this question of the borderland has uh, loomed large in our practice. And one of the archival materials that really started um, the process of Rock of Eye was really looking at Goyan Zaldúa's um, La Frontera. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that publication and, and its importance to you as an artist. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the first books that I read later after graduating. Um, and it was actually recommended to me by a grad student I was doing a visit with. And they're like, everything that <laughs> your work is, you need to He's read this book. book. <laughs> and um, Iris, shout out to Iris. And um, I read it and I was just, I'd never read anything that encapsulated what it was like to grow up on the border in terms of speaking Spanglish. It's written in English and Spanish. It also goes back and forth between text and poetry. Um, and as um, a Chicana feminist, like she even talks about queerness, which is a very mm -hmm. taboo thing in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of just like the way that she, I'm not gonna quote it correctly, but she talks about borderlands in a very kind of broad way in terms of like queer bodies, in terms of landscapes, in terms of borders that are created mm -hmm. um, by man, in terms of borders that are created by nature, um, like language borders, it's just very expansive. You've um, told the story before about first <laughs> arriving in, I love the story, so I, I <laughs> always ask you. I love the story uh, uh, because I think it tells us so much. I mean, there's one of the things I like about this conversation is the sort of um, hyper local experience that figures in both of your practices. And, you know, when Ashley were like, you know that spot in the botanical gardens, and like half the room is like, yeah, I know the spot. <laughs> um, but I think similarly, like when you have talked about. Uh, Troy, like that move from being in El Paso to, you know, showing up in New Jersey, and and um, it's not the same. You know, the, we all speak these sort of hyper local uh, dialects, and that those are visual dialects, those are experiential. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, crossing state lines in the eastern cor northeastern oh, corridor. <laughs> the story she wants me to tell. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, my family, we didn't really have money to be vacationing all the time, so we went to either southern New Mexico or other parts of Texas. It still never made it to Houston until this until year because it was 12 hours away <laughs> from El Paso. Yeah. So we stuck to like Austin was the mark, the end mark. Um, but when I went to grad school, that was like the first, the first time I left Texas was to do um, an undergrad fellowship at Yale. Actually, this is when it happened, at Yale Norfolk. And um, one of the painters, she had a car and she's like, we're gonna drive to Rhode Island. And so I was like, man, I'm gonna be in this car forever because Texas <laughs> is so big. And we were there in like a very short amount of time and I was confused. And I was like, where's the checkpoint where we have to weigh the car and they ask us if we're American? And she was like, uh, what are you talking Rhode about? Rhode Island doesn't have that checkpoint. <laughs> I, I, I just thought that every time you crossed a state, there was always that kind of highly like militarized presence, which mm -hmm. I grew up in and I didn't realize that was unusual mm -hmm. because El Paso was like, you had the troops, um, like the army troops, you had border patrol, you had the FBI, you <laughs> had the police department. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was all just kind of what El Paso was. So going to the East Coast, when I was shocked about how quickly you could travel to other states, um, but also that you didn't have Texas to constantly. yeah. <laughs> Um, mark yourself as I am American, I am legal. Mm -hmm. um, that sense of expansiveness, though, I, I, I want to also 
kind of take a note for that because it was such a part of our research and our making of the book and the, you know, the, um, the voluminous nature of, of, a, of the pant leg of a zoot suit, but the expansiveness and the expansiveness of the desert. I mean, all of this, this sense of um, non-border, like mm -hmm. where, where we don't reach the edge was such a big part of our thinking, I think, for the book and, um, and for the exhibition. Um, there was a moment that I'm just being reminded right now of when we were installing in Los Angeles and there was a, a work of choice. We were hanging two, suspending two garments um, and uh, up on a, on a wire across the, you know, there was a wire across the gallery and someone from the museum who's really in charge of making sure everyone's safe <laughs> when they enter. The, he was really concerned about this threshold. How are they going to delineate it and mark it for a public and an audience? You know, we're going to have kids in here. And it was it kind of strange that cut <laughs> the wire was like perfectly neck height. Um, so, you know, you could be running across and not see it. Um, and so they had proposed some wall text. And there was a moment where there was this question about putting on the wall, you know, attention or some kind of language to say, you know, you might run into a wire. But it was interesting. We immediately pulled back because that the resonance of, of being mindful um, in a gallery space, um, it was, you know, was so quickly mirrored by the language of any kind of border, right? And the danger um, that's associated with it. And I think, um, I think for all of us, there was that also that kind of revelation of the way that our bodies are, are managed and protected and controlled in space, but very much in museums, mm -hmm. right? Like how we talk about borderlands, um, but how also um, is is subjectivity controlled in these kinds of institutional spaces? Um, and that echo was really hard not to notice. Um, but with that, I want to uh, ask both of you really about the way that you think about borderlands in a formal sense in your work, because my sense is that both of you really turn to like lineations and thresholds and opportunities for trespassing, um, crossing over. Um, Ashley, you're nodding, so I'm, I want to know what you're, what you're thinking in your head. Um, well, when you said the museum, I was like, that's kind of why I got into using sound, because I like needed to break the walls between spaces mm -hmm. and like, oh, y'all's work is over here and your work is over here. <laughs> I'm like, it's everywhere. We can catch it. <laughs> um, but your story about um, going to New Jersey reminded me that I went on to a residency on a sailboat in like 2015. And only then did I realize that I was surrounded by walls, that the water mm -hmm. wasn't something I could ever reach. And people were like, what's your project on the boat? Like, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> uh, and I was just, I was reading like Octavia Butler and just like, <laughs> communing with the water and I didn't it took me a while I didn't realize that that kind of just got my mind going on this path of like breaking down because mm -hmm. I just didn't realize that I had that it was something you couldn't see mm -hmm. and I was like oh the reason why this sailing trip is really affecting me is because in my life growing up the water is always hidden mm -hmm. and um but yet affecting my life like so much pressure on the walls mm -hmm. of our lives are happening so it makes sense that now I'm realizing now we're talking that like you know boom while sewing and breaking down to refigure would be like a liberatory practice or like a free a freeing practice because of the rigidity of the architecture that we're surrounded by or speaking of architecture um, I have an image from an installation of yours up right now that um, draws from New Orleans-based architecture and porch work and, you know, the that sense of boundary of the walls that's yeah. missing, but it's there. Um, and I, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you gesture towards um, breaking through the wall, but through the use of architectural remnant. Yeah, I... Um, so I think it was a, it was kind of a logistical challenge where I was like, I want to change the space, but, like, I don't have the time or, like, I don't have the time to just change the entire thing. Um, and so I had to get more, um, gest not gestural, but more creative with how you could change something. And I think mm -hmm. that that kind of is my, like, little TED Talk, you know, soapbox is that, like, <laughs> you know, we can do small things to change mm -hmm. the world that we live in. 
And so in this situation, I was like, okay, I can't like make this into a porch, but I can like give the porch energy, which would be like taking this pattern. Like I was walking in mid city. I took a picture of the porch. I like copied that little kind of star shaped pattern along mm -hmm. the sides and then made my own little design with it. But there's something about framing a place differently. And then these also emitted the sound that um, was big timers instrumentals with uh, river sounds in between. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, and I, I love places where people have to pass through because they're kind of being washed with whatever you're putting out. And then also, I mean, like, you know, we're constantly passing through time. People are passing through dimensions of life and death. Porosity like of boundaries. Yeah, we're like constantly passing through something. And so I feel like highlighting that is also like a very effective you know, to reach the people. <laughs> yeah. Um, passing through, I want to go back a couple of um, steps. So when we were first making the book um, and you were scanning and working through old archival material, materials that had been um, used, bef that you'd used before in collages, and I think this was a really a moment of even turning back to one's practice and, and recognizing it as remnant of a historical practice, right? Of, uh, and repurposing and, and mm -hmm. um, thinking f freshly about some of these same materials. And so one of the materials that we returned to again and again were clothing patterns. Um, these clothing patterns that you collected uh, are suggestive certainly and, and figure into the life of the zoot suit, which has played such a central place in your practice. But they also became very swiftly a kind of cartography. Um, and it was really hard not to see um, something that w is more commonly applied to the body also be uh, a map of landscape. Um, and so in, in our galleries, they, um, uh, we were glad to have the work of um, Nazli Khan, a really wonderful graphic designer, um, to transpose some of those for floor works. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how these have, you know, how the work to garment production has also become a kind of um, wayfinding structure in your own collage. I mean, I kind of like what you mentioned about framing. Um, I mean, I've, uh, I don't even know who made the quote, but past is present. Mm -hmm. like that's something I'm always thinking of, and that can happen in architecture, but in terms of the clothing pattern, it frames our bodies, but even, I don't know, I've, I've always been really interested in subcultures and the way by what people wear, they're marked, um, mm -hmm. kind of in this type of performative way. Um, one, not always for performance, but sometimes it's just for personal identity, and that even becomes, I don't know, a skewed, but with the patterns, I kind of like thinking that people, I don't, I don't think I've ever encountered somebody that's afraid to cross the threshold of the vinyl, and that's something mm -hmm. that I enjoy growing up in a place, like hearing you talk about walls and rupture, I mean, in a very different context, the El Paso is all kind of along the line of the Rio Grande, um, which there was a fence even before Bush built the other <laughs> fence. Um, so it's, it's kind of like living in a space where you, you're constantly reminded that there's another side. Um, you're constantly seeing that wall, but then also being really young as a kid and thinking there's someone else on the other side having the same experience, almost like, like a, a parallel kind of universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I enjoyed about the patterns is, I don't know, I love teaching. Like I learned a lot from my students and teaching drawing, I was like, oh yeah, I used to love drawing. Like I mm -hmm. forgot about all of these things I would do. So in a way, the clothing pattern became like a talisman of another drawing but a drawing that's flat, but then becomes form, which then kind of envelops a body. Mm -hmm. And similarly with the sewing, um, even though it's along the lines of what the machine can do, it's, it almost feels like mark making for me, but I'm, I'm interested in the stitch as being something that's an attempt to try to make a dialogue, mm -hmm. but knowing that that stitch will always come apart, like mm -hmm. if there's too much pressure on either side. Mm -hmm. It's um, 
I want to go back to one thing that you said a moment ago was that you haven't seen anyone who didn't want to cross the vinyl. And I, I think to see um, in the installation of Rock of I, this was true in, at Cam Houston and uh, true in, at Cam in LA and as well as Cam Houston, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of vinyl on the ground that you know, you'd have to really play hopscotch to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, but it it also necessarily uh, requires um, the public to trespass over and over. Right? To, to one, am I am I stepping on the art? I'm stepping on the art. Oh, we're all stepping on the art, you know. And um, but that invitation to cross the line again and again across the exhibition. Um, Okay, so you, you both want to talk about the stitch, it's clear. We said we were going to hold the stitch. Um, she brought it so up first. <laughs> we promised we were going to hold the stitch. But one of the, uh, let's, let's take a look. Uh, well, first, let's, we'll hold Gloria and Zeldua just for a moment. Uh, we lay enclosed by margins, hems where only we existed. Um, one of the things that made... Uh, us want to hold this conversation today, at least one of the things that made me want to hold this conversation today um, was just the, the fact that these are two artists that have, whose practices are both rooted in histories and practices of collage, um, but have both found their way to sewing and stitch making and these, um, these forms of suturing. And I think, you know, we were having conversations the other day that the history of collage, and particularly because of its sort of 20, early 20th century um, uh, relevance is often associated with histories of rupture, of violence, of the cut, um, grown out of years of war uh, and dislocation. And there is something else happening in your practice. And I think the moment that you invite um, the needle and the thread into the practice, there's also um, a reparative practice at play. Um, and and in your TED talk uh, that you gave just moments ago. <laughs> um, I mean, this like, you know, these, mo these moves that you can make um, that can change, they can be small and they can change everything. Um, and that's been, you know, we've talked about this in your very subtle moves sometimes in collage. They're not radical gestures, they're, they're slight adjustments and then they're sewn. Um, you know, sewing is, can be associated and has been associated with histories of domestic practice. Um, we sew wounds, we, we suture. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear how both of you arrived um, at Thread in your, in your collages. You want me? <laughs> well, no, no. well you, when you said that it was something that can be changed, I feel like that is interesting because it's kind of what brought me to it was that it had a, a sense of tightness to it and like permanence because I was very much in like the glue exacto knife tape world um, <laughs> and I just needed it to be stronger because I just needed the piece to be able to move and like and you can see in this one like I like will be you know I'll have different parts that I want to thread together and I just want to move it around and like um, think that the threading like sewing I was like oh this is the most practical choice um, but then I didn't like when I started getting into it I was just kind of like being taken away by the sewing machine like the <laughs> very um the ability to do it in a way where I don't have a pattern and I can just kind of like let it be what it is, which is like in stark contrast to like having to maybe like repeat the same stitches every day, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that that's the, the, just keeping that in my mind that that's the other use of this machine and this technology is like more and more efficiency to move mm -hmm. more quickly. Mm -hmm. And I find myself being less and less efficient and sewing over and over <laughs> the same thing and you know, cutting them out and repositioning. And that's just, yeah, I don't know, that's. That's how you got to thread. Uh, yeah, because it was just, <laughs> and then it became a whole other world. <laughs> like, how did I, I, I guess I got to thread. For me, it's, it's almost like when I'm doing oof, these projects, it, not like I'm an actor, but it's almost like I'm a character actor, right? So I'm, I'm going through all the research, I'm listening to music from the time, I'm watching films from the time, and it made sense that I should kind of enact the language of the seamstress or the tailor for mm -hmm. the collage, just to get a sense of what it meant to make a garment. I still cannot make a garment, but I can work a machine now. Um, and I was really afraid to because I was like, I don't know how to sew anything. 
and I had seen too many horror films of like people sewing their fingers, <laughs> which actually seems really hard now that I sew. Yeah. I'm like, how are they doing that? <laughs> like, that seems really hard to do. Um, and I, th I had a friend who had a, a machine. I tried it on one of the woven drawings and it worked so i was like get out of the way and then i just like <laughs> went to town um i learned because that machine busted so i learned that when you're sewing things you're not supposed to the machine it'll break it'll break <laughs> um so now i'm a lot nicer with my machine but i think there is something about the thread as well with going back to anzal Dua, she has this quote talking about the border as um um, un, un herida abierta, which is an open wound. Um, mm. And so for me, like the, the thread almost becomes this way of trying to suture or make sense of these kind of two worlds. Mm -hmm. um, but also, oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, but also it's, it's kind of freeing. It's, I feel like in these pandemic times, I've tried so many forms of meditation um, so sometimes in my studio it feels meditative because you have to be present because you're using knives and yeah. and things. But with the sewing machine, it's like I can't not be present because I can't watch a film. Like I have to just kind of use the machine while I'm using it and be present in that moment and always vigilant. Um, both of you have used used thread, um, but you've also you you use grommets. Uh, mm -hmm. That was in, in this past piece and um, yeah, and they're, they're in a number of pieces um, and this is a work it's a little bit hard to see in this image but um, this is a very long linear run um, of smaller works that are connected by zippers vertical zippers um, and I mentioned this because both the grommet and it's and the zipper is suggestive of you know and I don't I don't know that you would do this um, but that one could reassemble it could be reassembled differently right this could be reordered and I, I want to use this to come back to the archive, um, this question about uh, taking materials and the subtle shifts we make and sometimes the major leaps we make and you know, to, to work in a historical archive and to draw out that relationship and assemble you know, adjacent to contemporary work, contemporary moment. Um, how do you think about reassembly? What role does temporal reassembly as well as kind of material reassembly uh, play in your practice? Hmm. I think there's, um, when I'm, when I was looking at like basketball cards or even my grandmother's photos from when she was a coach, there was so much potential energy in the imagery that mm -hmm. I was like looking at that I made me really excited. Like there's, you, you know, we're just saying about like the like meditative, like act of sewing. There's like also a meditation or a kind of imagination, emotional journey mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about this too of like going through archival images or images from the past whether it's your personal past or someone else's past that just you're like oh this is something mm -hmm. and I think like choosing the way it's gonna go is kind of like sacrificing all the other possible ways, ways it, it could, could go, go. Mm -hmm. and so I kind of I like using grommets because there's I'm like oh I could change it you know it could and it could totally change but I think when you are looking upon the past and thinking about all the stories that you, like all of the stories that come from that one moment, you, you kind of do have to be like, okay, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna follow this emotional feeling that I'm having from this to this particular outcome. But mm -hmm. they're also with the zippers and with grommets, there's like an idea that there's other, there's more stories. Like there are, just because you're looking at one thing and you're interpreting it one way when there's, the way it came to be and all the context around it. There's so many other factors. So it's I, kind of nice. I want to, um, we were, t when we were talking the other day and you, you said, well, you began to talk about something. I said, Oh, you know, have you read Nathaniel Rich's book? And some of you may know Nathaniel Rich. He's an, uh, an author who lives here in town, um, and who writes about sort of environmental calamity. Um, <laughs> can't imagine why he lives here. Um, but you know, the, his most recent book is really foregrounding the fact that we don't live in a natural world, and so much of, of both of your practices have look at what we might think of, what we commonly term the natural world versus the subject, right? The figure versus the ground, but that there's this, some, you know, when we use that language, we have some suggestion of, like, oh, the un, undisrupted landscape, right? Um, but, of course, we're in an utterly disrupted landscape. We no longer live in 
in the pre-man world, right? And so it goes back to that question you were in your TED talk um, of you know, what kind of world, if we're going to be world making, we know we're already world making, what kind of world do we want to make? And, and it seems to me that both of these tools, um, they give you a lot of options about how we might resituate history, mm -hmm. uh, reframe some of the materials that we have at our disposal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yep. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I feel like, I don't know, I guess world making for me is creating a world where, I, I don't know, I don't like the word marginalized, but you know what I mean? Stories that fall through the cracks kind of get their time in the light. Um, I don't, I'm thinking of this video I saw of, of Miriam Makeba kind of talking about history and that history is written by the victor. Mm -hmm. And that's something I always think about um, just kind of just where I grew up and these people that I held to such high esteem and knowing as I tried to filter through through my own history, like there was so much lost. A lot of it was just through stories that like my great grandfather had told my grandma and you couldn't really ask your parents questions <laughs> at the time. And uh, for me, it was kind of just heartbreaking, but also being at peace with there is something that I don't know, I, I want the attempt to know, but ultimately if I can't know, then that's fine. But I still want to make the gesture of trying to piece together lineage. Mm -hmm. um, this evening's talk is occasioned by the Amistad Rivers uh, Research Residency. Um, and Troy is our, is our second victim. And um, with this, we have, you know, you have been spending a lot of time in the extraordinary wealth of materials that is available to anyone um, because it is a public archive um, and uh, with an exceptional community of archivists dedicated to making those histories that it holds um, available and circulated and uh, in community. Um, you were here in May, and and this is this trip is the sort of concluding moment to this this research residency. Um, I wonder if you, you know, because as we said, all of this was out of order. <laughs> um, so we, the research residency has actually become um, a moment to depart from, expound, um, take a sharp turn from where this recent body of work, Rock of I, um, led you and I'm I'm curious to learn or well I know but uh, I'm curious for you to share with others where your research has has led in the archive um, how it is related to where we've been and, and and where you've been in your practice um, yeah I mean coming I don't know I feel spoiled working at with Amistad because it's so fun like the people that work there um, I've had a great time and it's just like super knowledgeable people and they're like, did I hear you say this? Well, you should look at this. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. But Lisa's laughing because she I know, said it. Lisa <laughs> and Jade and, um, <laughs> but one thing I stumbled upon was just these archives from artists, artists in the Harlem Renaissance, which mm -hmm. I had known about, but I didn't know specifically about uh, Richmond Barté. And I became really into his, I don't know, I guess there is something that I could relate to this type of, of queerness, but also there's something kind of heartbreaking about his archive. And I, I started to think a lot about the, the lives that we lead and having the photograph is kind of the only representation. So it's looking through his photo albums. There's like ones of him posing with his sculptures and other artist friends, but then there's like anonymous ones of like young handsome men and I'm <laughs> like okay what is this about but it just says like th there's no like um, classification for it so uh, I'm interested in kind of these books that are supposed to hold our lives and our memories and even at that there's something that will get lost in translation mm -hmm. um, and it's been kind of funny just reading the correspondence between like him and Harold Jackman and County Colin um, and recently I was looking at the archives of Richard Bruce Nugent, who was a very, I don't know, <laughs> making those, that work at that time. I don't know. I, it's in a way I feel like I'm looking at these people who really paved the way 
And that's something I think that also gets downplayed in the Harlem Renaissance that a lot of these writers and performers and artists were queer. Mm -hmm. That's something that always gets left out of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Which you know also comes back to questions about the archive. What you know, how does and we've had these conversations internally. You know, um, papers get uh, bequeathed with certain terms associated. What what is to be circulated? How are they supposed to be narrated? What can be shared? What can't be shared? And so even the the archival histories are partial. Um, and I think one of the really thrilling parts uh, for me as a as a curator and sort of witness to uh, artist research in the archive has been the. The, this kind of resuturing to go back to questions of, of sewing, of, of you know, reciting some of these histories in complex histories that may not figure as readily or as transparently in the archive, but there's, there's work to be done to you know, piece back together how, how parts of a life might be lived. Um, for both of you, I think you know, we've had so many conversations and your practices are so rooted in questions of landscape and, um, and it's impossible, especially, you know, we were saying this the other day, actually looking at some of your m recent works, which so easily could be rendered as garments because of their hanging structures, that there is always that place of the figure, that, you know, these landscapes are holding space for figures and subjectivity, and um, that that relationship persists across. Um, I have enjoyed this conversation so much with both of you. Um, and I want to afford the opportunity for any questions in the audience. Anyone? Any brave soul? Marianne? draw a lot of inspiration from stuff that I just see walking around. Um, but I guess specifically, um, I've been printing out photos on like, it's like one of the slides that you showed was like some like large prints that I did. And I just kind of like was dragging them around, like bringing them, you know, from one studio downstairs to like cut this thing and sew them and stuff. And I kind of just everything that happens in the process of like trying to make the thing I just like <laughs> I keep telling myself because you don't want to get too like precious about it but just being like everything that happens while I'm making this is a part of its life mm -hmm. and that's I just like let all of that process whether it's like dirt or my dog walking on it in the like in its life with me I just like that's becomes layers of meaning that are just embedded into it. If it's dinged or broken or ripped in some way while I have it. But then also I think I just, I, I w d wasn't doing sculpture really until I, I mean, I guess I was, other people might argue and say I was doing <laughs> it this whole time, but I wasn't really doing it. And then I just kind of started to see things that like, there's a, I like found a pile of wood next to the London Avenue Canal on like Allen Toussaint Boulevard by the bridge. And then I was like, okay, I need to like make this I was like, okay, here's the material. So I guess I need to like clean this wood and like turn it into a thing because the earth is just like, we have left so much stuff. There's so much stuff everywhere mm -hmm. um, that we're kind of being given opportunities to make things all the time. Um, and you had some sculptures in your show that I loved. Mm -hmm. I liked it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Sculpture is a scary word. Oh, sorry. sorry. You're talking um, clothing assemblage. Racks? Assemblage. <laughs> assemblage. <laughs> so. No, I mean. Yeah, where did, yeah. How did you kind of. When I, when I quit sport? painting in grad school, <laughs> I hung out a lot with the sculptors because I was like, I want to see it in real life. I don't want to paint it or like depict it. Um, and then sculptors are very critical. So then I backed <laughs> away. Um, I, I don't know. Sometimes it just feels 
I use intuition a lot, and yeah. I like hearing yeah. you talk about <laughs> kind of the materials going through their own history in your studio and with you, because yeah. that happens in my studio where I collect something, and it's like, whoa, I love that weird green piece of wood, and I just need it, and it may sit there for years, or it may be an instant connection, but there's a lot of like juxtaposition that's happening with from, from which for me, I guess, feels like dialogues. Like I think visual art is a language, which at times is hard to, to put <laughs> into everyday language, but it's like, okay, does the green piece of wood work with this thing or that thing? And, and it's just knowing like inside if that's correct or not. But I think being an older millennial, <laughs> There was something about handling a photograph, which for me is as an object, was so important and very intimate, but also knowing that the photograph is a record of something that's confined by its frame. So I have, I have no knowledge of what's beyond that frame, which could totally change the narrative that it's being depicted. Um, but I am very interested in the life of objects um, which is why I scan things still, even with the problematic magazines. I still scan them um, just to have some type of record of proof of their existence before I work into them. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Images, oof. How do I <laughs> choose the images? I, I've noticed now with the years of collaging, I'm drawn to high contrast imagery. I like kind of older forms of photography. And I think it's because there's something about analog that feels more weighted and malleable as opposed to digital can feel very cold and slick. Um, so I do like materials that are a little bit more matte. Um, and I don't know, there's something about like handling that material. A lot of these older magazines, they were just printed better, um, like thicker cardstock. And strangely enough, in those magazines, there's so much like modernist design, mm -hmm. like things that you would never see now, yeah. um, like weird croppings, a lot of empty space. And it's, mm -hmm. it is interesting to see like the history of publication from, I guess I've worked with things from like the 20s up until now like how everything feels a lot thinner, a lot more mm -hmm. slick, a lot more photo photoshopped, a lot more glossy, where before it felt like more, I don't know, it felt like more like a weighted object than mm -hmm. maybe imagery now. Um, photographs, I'm trying to think, do I use photographs? <laughs> Not so much. I mean, like the actual, I can test. I think that's. <laughs> I think it's false. <laughs> not family photographs. Family photographs. I, I do also source a lot from online. Um, yeah, so I do a lot of online searches, like El Paso, Texas, and so I use a lot of like press photography mm -hmm. that's been discarded. But in terms of like family photographs, yeah. I still can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. I'm really drawn to images where there's like a dramatic. This a dramatic thing happening <laughs> in the picture, even when I'm taking them, like just I mean, I think that might even come from the basketball cards because like in a basketball card, it's like you already know what's going on. Like <laughs> someone is like blocking, and they're reaching, they're doing some very dramatic thing, which is like the center point of that. And I feel like spending so much time staring at those and like searching for the perfect like finesse moment. Mm. Kind of like in my own photography, like when I'm looking at what I want to make a collage with, it's kind of like these things that have this like dramatic, um, not dramatic, but very graphic action, which might kind honestly dynamic. like the contrast too, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I'll like impose that on it. But I love um, also things that are, can be like inside or outside. Like it's kind of like you can, can't really tell maybe where 
what's where the photo is being taken from or some kind of mix up or abstraction with that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I kind of look for that. And it's interesting that you mentioned the digital and the, and the analog because I've been, I was taking digital photographs when I was exploring that. And, but then I just started using only film photography. Mm -hmm. And so some, I've been noticing that just by chance, I'm like, oh, I want to put this one with this one, but it's a digital and an mm -hmm. analog. Mm -hmm. And the analog does, it just has like a, a depth and a warmth to it that, you know, you can, your eye, your eye feels like mm -hmm. when you look at it, there's a, like a subtlety or a softness of the color or the paper that you just kind of, you can see the vintageness of it, which I think just now that we have every type of photography and image reproduction available, each one of those choices like gives changes the affect of the overall experience with it, which is kind of a fun thing about technology that we can utilize all those different tools. But yeah, mm -hmm. I like that shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, thank you to Troy. Thank you for Ashley. Uh, to Ashley. Um, so grateful to everyone who could be here, but also to the whole team at Amistad and at Rivers who's made this research residency possible. Um, please, we are we are celebrating tonight with, um, I think Ashley was the one who gave Troy the original recommendation to go to Little Dizzy's when he first came here, and he took it to heart. <laughs> um, he has had more meals at Little Dizzy's <laughs> in a very short window of time. Good. So we uh, decided to gift him on his way out with um, a Little Dizzy's piece, and we hope you will uh, join us outside for um, refreshment and nourishment. So thank you all. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Thank <laughs> you.